Good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining. Today's topic is introduction to Modbus. First thing is if I could ask everyone to make sure that they're muted, that will allow everything to go more smoothly. Following the presentation, I will have some time for questions and answers this week. So let's get started. So let's start with the basics. What is Modbus? Modbus was developed by Modicon in 1979 for use with their PLCs. Modbus allowed larger and more accurate data exchanges than analog I.O. and discrete I.O. could provide. More importantly, it also made it easier to add data to an existing project since this did not require additional I.O. to be added or a panel to be rewired. While Modbus began life as a proprietary protocol, it has evolved as the de facto standard across many industries for terminal devices to connect to supervisory systems. In the HVAC world, most devices manufactured to modern standards can support Modbus. Although it is now common, there are slight differences in how different manufacturers support Modbus. Once these differences are understood, it becomes easier to connect devices from different manufacturers together. Almost all FireEye devices offer Modbus as standard. The ability to be able to collect data from a device is an important consideration when making a device selection. So with traditional inputs and outputs, we'll start with analog. Analog I.O. is used when a value of a variable range needs to be transmitted between devices. Analog inputs can accept a range of voltage or current and convert this into an internal value for use in the PLC process. Conversely, analog outputs do the opposite. They convert an internal value into a voltage or a current. 0 to 10 volt DC and 4 to 20 milliamp are examples of analog that most of you are familiar with. Wiring a single analog signal requires one pair of wires, meaning that a more complex interface would require many pairs of wires to be run, as well as a lot of inputs or outputs to be, to be avail available on the hardware. An issue with analog is resolution. Analog resolution determines the range of the raw number that the PLC or device can accept. A higher resolution means that there can be more steps of control, which translates into higher precision. Resolution is measured in bits. 8-bit means that the maximum analog value is 2 to the power of 8, which is 256 steps. This would be interpreted as a raw number from 0 to 255, meaning that each step can see a change of 0 0.04 volts. If that is sufficient accuracy, 8-bit would work. Other resolution values are common, such as 12-bit, which would have 4,096 steps, or 0 0.0025 volts per step, or even 16-bit, which is 65536 steps, uh, with even finer resolution of 0 0.00015 volts per step. Discrete I.O. is used when a value that only has two states, such as on or off, has to be transmitted between devices. Discrete I.O. is also referred to sometimes as binary I.O. or sometimes digital I.O., which is actually an incorrect uh, way to describe it, but we'll see that on the next slide. Discrete I.O. is represented as a 0 or 1 for use in the PLC. As an input, a voltage is applied to a terminal to indicate an on status. This voltage can range from 24 volts DC to 120 volts DC or even 230 volts DC depending on, upon the hardware used. Outputs can either be solid state with a voltage coming out from a terminal or a voltage-free relay contact. Digital I.O. detects rapid changes between on and off to create byte streams. Byte streams are used to relay data in many formats. Digital transmission of byte streams form the basis of much of today's technology. Compact disks were one of the first consumer products to use byte streams, and today it is common with internet streaming and even over-the-air television. In all formats, Modbus uses byte streams. There are three main forms that Modbus can take, with the first two listed being the most common. The first is Modbus RTU, which uses a form of serial transmission and is common on lower cost end devices, and Modbus TCP, which communicates over an Ethernet connection. Then there's also Modbus ASCII, which uses a form of serial transmission but is not commonly used. Serial connections have a number of additional parameters. The parameters used are common to any serial protocol. The baud rate defines the number of bits per second that are transmitted. The baud rates must match for communication between devices to be possible. 
the most common baud rates are 9600 or 19200. The baud rate can only be as high as the slowest device on the serial network. Data bits are fixed at 8 for Modbus RTU and 7 for Modbus ASCII. Stop bits are always 1 for Modbus. Parity can be odd, even, or none, but this much must also match across devices. Parity adds an extra bit that makes the total number of 1s in a byte stream odd or even, which is used to detect errors in a message. With Modbus, the parity is most often set to none since error detection is handled using a protocol-specific error checking algorithm. Ethernet baud rates are in the millions of BPS, making Ethernet much, much faster in general than serial communication. With Modbus RTU, a device is either a master or a slave. There can only be one master on a network. A master is the client that the server is serving to, so it is also referred to as a client. A slave serves data upon request, so it is also referred to as a server. Each slave must have a unique address or node number to reply to queries. This is so that none, no more than one device, uh, this is so that more than one device does not respond, which would cause a collision in data. With Modbus RTU, the first uh, variety is RS-232, and with RS-232, only two devices can be connected since there are separate transmit and receive lines. The physical connection requires three wires to transmit byte streams. When connecting the, the devices, cross-connect the transmit to the receive and the receive to the transmit so that one device transmit connects to the other device receive. The common ground is used as a reference for both the transmit and receive. A voltage of plus 3 to plus 15 in indicates a 0 byte, while a voltage of minus 3 to minus 15 would indicate a 1 byte. Voltages between negative 3 and plus 3 indicate an idle state. A large downside of RS-232 is that the maximum cable distance is fairly limited and is determined by the baud rate. At 19,200 baud, for example, the maximum distance would be 50 feet. The most common physical connection is the DB9 connector, commonly seen on a traditional PC serial port or a USB to RS-232 converter, and that's shown at the right. At one time, it was common for devices that would connect to a PC to use RS-232. This was because all computers had one or more native RS-232 serial ports. Devices that used this connection included modems, scales, terminals, or PLC programming ports. Even though a new PC does not have an RS-232 serial port, USB to RS-232 serial port adapters are cheap and easy to find. Due to this, many of the legacy devices that used RS-232 serial ports continue to offer them, although many now accept a USB connection directly. Unless the device is a standalone unit, it does not make sense to use RS-232 interface with a new design. Modern designs have the need to network multiple devices together, as well as longer distance limitations. FireEye devices do not use RS-232 for any connections. Next we have RS-485. Multiple devices can be connected since transmit and receive are integrated on the same line. The physical connection requires one twisted pair of wires to transmit byte streams. The voltage differential between the two lines indicates the byte status. The twisted pair requirement means that any interference that is read on the lines will be on both lines, meaning that the voltage differential will remain the same since the interference will cancel out. A common ground wire should not be required, but it is not uncommon to see one, and some devices do have a terminal for this connection. There is a much longer maximum distance due to the resistance to interference. The maximum distance does go down as the baud rate increases. Up to 90k baud, the maximum distance is around 4,000 feet, over 4,000 feet, which is not over a mile, and goes down after that. RS-485 is normally half-duplex, meaning that only one device can communicate at a time. This is similar to how a walkie-talkie or a two-way radio works. Half-duplex is referred to as two-wire. FireEye devices all use half-duplex connections. And what I mean by a walkie-talkie or a two-way radio is that only one device can talk at a time until it releases the line. RS-485 can also be full-duplex, meaning that devices can communicate simultaneously. This would be similar how it telephone works where two parties could talk at the same time. Full duplex is also referred to as four wire. Full duplex RS-485 is very similar to the RS-422 standard. 
And the way it works is because the extra pair of wires allows simultaneous communication. With RS-45, there are no standardized connectors. Most commonly seen are terminal blocks, but modular connectors such as RJ9, RJ10, RJ22, which is a four position modular connector similar to a handset jack on an old telephone, RJ11 or RJ12, which is a six position connector similar to a telephone jack, and RJ45, which is similar to an ethernet connector, are common. The pinouts from these connectors is also not standardized, so it is important to determine this before making any cables or connections. There is also little consistency used in the naming of the data lines. Some common markings are D plus or D minus, B plus with NA minus, A plus and B minus, AB or just plus and minus. Sometimes they are also referred to as the inverting and non-inverting lines, since they are the opposite of each other at all times due to the standard measuring of the voltage differential. The connections are polarity sensitive, so if communication is not established, try again with the wire swapped. The good thing is incorrect polarity will not harm the devices. A four-wire device will label the connections as some derivative of transmit and receive or send, with each having a plus and minus terminal as well. To connect a four-wire device to a two-wire network, you would jumper the two plus and the two minus terminals together. FireEye products will present the Modbus connection through either terminal blocks, an RJ9-10-22, which is a four-position modular jack, or an RJ45 eight-position modular jack. When modular jacks are used, parallel jacks allow easy multi-dropping of devices using pre-made cables. Parallel jacks means two jacks beside each other on the device. For example, four YB110s with YZ300 enunciators could all be connected to one ED610, which is the converter device shown on the left that has terminal blocks, using eight ED512 connect cables. Each device would connect to the next using a cable, and the last device would connect to the ED610. The master device can then connect to the ED610 using terminals 9, which is B, and 10, which is A. All of the devices should be connected in a serial or daisy chain topology only. FireEye devices usually provide one large terminal or two separate terminals or two modular jacks to make this easier to accomplish. The last device in the chain may need a termination resistor on the end of the line to balance out the impedance of the twisted pair cabling used. This impedance is typically 100 to 120 ohms. The documentation for the cable used should indicate the impedance. The termination resistor can be a physical resistor across the data lines, or there may be a jumper or dip switch to apply a termination resistor. Up to 32 devices can normally be connected in a network unless special low power transceivers are used and a higher limit is specified. And what that means is according to the normal Modbus standard, or the RS-485 standard, uh, the power requirement would allow 32 devices to be connected. At some point they wanted more than that, so the manufacturers of the RS-45 transceivers created lower power versions of these. So if you had a quarter power transceiver, you could have four times more devices. It is possible to convert an RS-232 signal to an RS-45 signal when required. This can allow the use of an RS-232 master to multiple RS-45 slaves or it can allow an RS-232 slave to connect to an RS-45 network. Converters are passive, so they will allow conversion in both directions. This works because RS-232 and RS-45 themselves are not protocols, just a means of transmitting the byte streams. Converters may require an external power supply or may power themselves from the power provided in the byte streams. So Modbus TCP. As with Modbus RTU, a device can either be a master or a slave. A big difference, however, is that there can be multiple masters on a Modbus TCP network. This is because the data will not collide due to the bandwidth and internal management afforded by the TCP IP environment allows this. Addresses or node numbers are not always used with TCP since there are IP addresses. The IP addresses are required to be unique, so this is, there is, sufficient, so this is sufficient to direct the traffic to the device. Modbus TCP devices are connected using standard powered Ethernet switches. Connections use free topology and can be arranged in any way. TCP stands for Transmission Control Protocol. TCP has multiple ports that can operate simultaneously, i.e. a web browser on port 80, an email server on port 23, 
and Modbus TCP on port 502. TCP defines the format of the message to pass data from one device to another. IP addresses are part of TCP IP protocol suite, which includes TCP and IP, which is the internet protocol. IP addresses are the identifying portion of the protocol so that messages go to the correct device. To establish a connection between two Modbus TCP devices, they must be on the same network or some form of routing must be in place. The devices can either be physically connected or use a wireless adapter or Wi-Fi. Two devices can also be directly connected with a crossover cable, although many devices will auto-switch direct connections. Modbus is an attractive protocol because it is very simple. All data is stored in internal buffers as unsigned 16-bit data and can be interpreted in many different ways to represent other forms of information. Addresses are used to reference specific pieces of internal data known as registers. Modbus uses function codes to specify which function is to be performed. Basic functions are read data and write data. The starting register and how many consecutive registers to use are specified as well as the node address of the device, which can be from 1 to 247 that is being messaged. A special function called broadcasting is specified in the Modbus standard. This means that by using a node address of 0, all devices will process a write command without issuing any response. Not all devices or writable registers do support broadcast messaging. And in this example, it shows 10 data addresses and the values that are inter internal to those data addresses. Then now the nice thing about Modbus is the format of the data itself is very consistent to be 16-bit integers. However, it can be interpreted in different ways, as we'll see. A request for 16-bit unsigned data directly references the contents of a register. The range of available values for this type are from 0 to 65535, and this equals 2 to the 16th power minus 1. This type of register is used when a number will always be greater than 0 and will always be less than or equal to 65535. A request for 32-bit unsigned data combines the bits from two consecutive registers. The range of available values for this type are from 0 to 429-496-7295, which is about 4.5 billion. This equals 2 to the 32nd power minus 1. This type of register is used when a number will always be greater than 0 and can be larger than 65535. And this is uh, typical for something such as total cycles on a system. Now the way this works is it takes the contents of the two registers and combines all of the bits together to create one larger number. A request for 16-bit signed data references the contents of a register but applies a positive or negative sign. The range of available values of this type are from negative 32,768, which equals 2 to the power of 15, to positive 32,767, which equals 2 to the power of 15 minus 1. This type of register is used when a number can be negative or positive and will not exceed the specified limits. It's also possible to create 32-bit signed data, but it is less common. And you would use signed data, obviously, whenever the value in the register could be negative. The documentation will either specify that the data is 16 or 32-bit, or will reference that the data spans one or two registers. Signed and unsigned data will look the sa same up to the signed limit of 32,767 for 16-bit. If the value is greater than that, it may be meant to be interpreted as signed or as a 32-bit number. Integer types cannot include decimal places, and this is very important with Modbus. The common convention is to imply decimal points and to note this in the documentation. For example, a servo position of 35.8 angular degrees would be reported via Modbus as 358. The documentation would note that it is necessary to divide the result by 10 or by specifying a resolution of 0 0.1. More specific values can be obtained by formatting the data as a floating point number or a real number. The downside of this is that each value will occupy two registers since floating point data is 32-bit. The format used is the single precision IEEE 754 standard. This uses 23 of the bits for the core of the data, 8 bits for the exponent to apply, and 1 bit for the positive or negative sign. 
This allows for the precise representation of dynamic data over a wider range. And because it uses the IEEE 754 standard, the PLC will have an accompanying data format. So with 32-bit data, uh, both unsigned integers and floating point numbers, since they use two registers each, it is important to note the order of the two registers to be accessed. While they must be consecutive, it is not standardized as to which comes first when reassembling the bits. The two registers are often referred to as the least significant word or the most significant word. When creating a message, the PLC usually has an option to swap the order if the message doesn't yield the correct data. This may be necessary since the proper order is not always published and there is no standard to the order of the words. Text data can also be stored as 8-bit characters using the standard ASCII table. Two characters are stored per register. The byte order is referred to as the least significant byte or the most significant byte and there is also no standard to this. An incorrect byte order is easy to spot since letters will be reversed. So instead of a message saying A, B, C, D, it would read B, A, D, C, since each word of two bytes is going to be reversed. Then there's enumerated data, and this is very common. The integer value of the data may represent a specific status, such as the operating phase. If this is the case, the documentation will define in a table what each value represents. So in this example, the first register shows the status, and the table below that shows what each value represents as a status for a burner logics message. Bit data can also be embedded into 16-bit unsigned integers, and in fact, this is usually how it's presented. Bit data allows reading a single register of on or off value, and you can yield up to 16 discrete data points by putting them into one 16-bit unsigned integer. And they are usually grouped into logical categories. So in this example, one of the registers will group inputs and the other will group outputs. And depending on which bit is on, it will tell you if an input or an output is on. Modbus has function codes to uh, transmit data. But the most common are function 4, which is a request to read input registers. I mean, in input registers are read-only registers. Function 3, which is to read holding registers function 6, which is to write a single holding register, and function 16, which is to write multiple holding registers. At a minimum, most devices will support functions 3 and 16. Function 16 can encompass the functionality of function 6, since a single register is the same as multiple register with a length of 1. There are other functions for things like bit data and special functions for features like device self-identification, but these are not frequently supported. Here's a sample message structure. So if you wanted to read register 0 for a length of 1 from node 1 using function 3, you would create a byte stream as such. Now normally this is going to be abstracted by your software or your PLC. You're just going to say which register you want to read, how many registers, the node address, and the function code, and all of the byte stream is going to be created for you. But I'm just showing here, this is the byte stream that is created. It starts with a node number, includes the function, has two bytes for the register you want to start at, two bytes for the length, and then it creates a CRC to error check the message on the other end. And the response, if the message is valid, will include a lot of the same information to identify. However, it will also include the result. So in this case, the data will be presented in um, bytes in the, in the return message. The purpose of the CRC, uh, which stands for Cyclic Redundancy Check, is to verify that the message is valid on both ends. So the CRC is calculated from the message and must match. Matching the CRC ensures that the intended message did not change in transit. Without a CRC, the master or slave could exchange faulty data without any way of verifying it. Modbus TCP byte streams have an additional six bytes at the beginning of a message, which is referred to as a TCP wrapper. Additionally, Modbus TCP does not use a CRC since error checking is a native part of the TCP IP protocol. Modbus TCP contains a node address byte, but it, it isn't often used since addressing is normally done with the IP address. If node addresses are supported, you theoretically could have multiple node addresses per IP address. Devices should reply with exception responses when the message is asking for invalid functions, invalid data addresses, or references invalid data values. The terminology used 
may refer to invalid as illegal, which simply means that the device does not support them. An exception is noted by adding hex 80 to the function in the reply, followed by the exception code. So a device should respond to an invalid message with an exception response, although some devices may not respond at all to an invalid message. The good thing about an uh, exception response is that you, at least you know that it's connected correctly because you are receiving a valid message in return. It is just telling you that the data you asked for or the address you asked for or the data you tried to write are invalid in some way. Input registers are read-only. You use function 4 to read from input registers. Input registers may also be referred to as 3x registers. When used, input registers usually mirror the contents of the holding register with the same address. Input registers are, not, are normally not used and are not always supported. Holding registers can be read or written. These are the most commonly used registers. You would use function 3 to read from holding registers and function 6 or 16 to write to holding registers. Holding registers may also be referred to as 4x registers. When register types are referred to as 3x or 4x, the first register is always 30001 or 40001. The maximum address allowed is 365536 or 465536. The original specification had maximum addresses of 3999 or 49999, but the register address field is 16 bits, so it was expanded because there was no reason to limit it to 10,000 addresses. When register types are referred to by function code, the first register is always zero, and the 3x or 4x nomenclature is not used at all. And this is a big deal with Modbus, is do you start the addressing at zero or one? So if it is referred to starting at zero or using the function code, you will start at zero. Register addresses can be listed in a mapping document in decimal or hexadecimal format. If specified in 3x or 4x format, their addresses are always going to be in decimal format. And that would be when the address would list as 40001 instead of as 0. Note that 3x registers use function 4 and 4x registers use function 3, so you have to pay attention to the details. And I'm not sure why it ended up that way. So when you're testing a connection, uh, you would want to test a Modbus device using a PC with a serial port if it's Modbus RTU or an Ethernet connection for Modbus TCP. For Modbus RTU, a USB to RS-232 or a USB to RS-45 serial port must be used, depending on if your Modbus RTU uses 232 or 485. For Modbus TCP, the normal Ethernet connection on your computer can be used if the device can be pinged on the same network. There are many programs available with Modbus master functionality, some for sale and some available at no cost. ModScan is the most commonly used program for testing the connections to slave devices. ModScan works with both, both Modbus RTU and Modbus TCP. Before making any connections to a supervisory system or a PLC, it is useful to connect using ModScan to make sure that Modbus is set up correctly on the device, the address is correct, the baud rate is correct, and by testing the read and write functionality. Shortbus Modbus Scanner is a free alternative that has the functionality of ModScan as well as the ability to record text logs. There are also many programs available with Modbus Slave functionality, some for sale and some available at no cost. ModSim is the most commonly used program to simulate a slave device. The software allows simulating data to verify that the master is pulling correctly. It can be an invaluable tool when you're troubleshooting a connection issue. And in this case, if you were having an issue with the PLC connecting to the device, you can use ModSim to simulate the device and see if you get a response at the PLC. Shortbus Modbus Server is a free alternative that has much of the functionality of ModSim as well as the ability to record text logs. When troubleshooting a connection issue, you want to break down the connection completely and start from the beginning. So first you want to communicate with the slave device using a test program as we just went over, such as ModScan. This is done to ensure that Modbus has been properly activated in the device. This will also verify that the baud rate and other settings are set appropriately. You want to begin with a simple message, such as reading just the first register. The same procedure can be done to simulate the slave device from the master as well. If a log can be recorded, the byte streams will contain all of the information to help troubleshoot why the data isn't in the correct format. Issues such as improper offset, when the master software may be one-based instead of zero-based, or improper formatting of float or 32-bit data can be exposed this way. 
Since the response bytes can be seen, they can be manually assembled in the reverse direction to see if the data is valid. Sometimes swapping the word order will cover up an improper offset. This is especially true when there is a lot of zero data surrounding registers in question. The result may be proper when commissioned, but will be incorrect when the zero data changes. In the example, the floating point data represented in registers 0 and 1 will read 12.5 when you put them together. If the first register is switched to 1 and the registers 1 and 2 are then swapped, the result will also be 12.5 because it will still come through as 0 and 16712 only with a different address and a, and a swap. But this would be a falsely correct reading, and if the 0 data and 2 changed, you would not be reading the correct information. For Modbus TCP, the devices need to be on the same network and have the ability to ping one another. It doesn't matter if the connections to the network are wired or wireless via Wi-Fi. It is important to note that IP addresses cannot be duplicated on a system. If they are, they can be nuisance problems such as data that seems to be changing for no apparent reason. So the conclusion. While Modbus may seem intimidating, if attention is paid to the details, it is a very easy protocol to work with. The appeal of Modbus is that the data is presented very simply and it is up to the user to determine how to format it. So you want to get the tools needed to troubleshoot issues, and if they are broken down to basic levels, the connection can be built up until the root of the issues can be identified and corrected. Thanks for watching.